we are definitely moving towards spring. We've got little aconites and snowbells popping up through the leaves of fall and winter. The weather has mellowed enough in the last few days that almost all of the snow has gone except for a few really cool microclimates and the snow melting has brought up the water table quite a bit at our main six acre site here in Trumansburg, New York. I thought it'd be fun to do a long form video wandering and looking at all of the water features, the large scale hand dug ponds from this last summer and see how they're performing. So hopefully that's of interest to you. So right now I'm standing at about the midpoint of this six acre property looking due west. The really large hand dug pond is back in that corner, which we'll take a look at in a moment. That's the cistern that's associated with it. The smaller irrigation pond is over in that area, and so we'll aim over there as well. I thought I'd take a short detour and look first. So that whole watershed partially drains through this minor valley and into this particularly wet bowl area of the property. And it's kind of neat to see some of these smaller, more complex waterways nearly at their peak. So this is almost like a waru-waru type system of shallow water next to raised beds repeated over and over again. So we get the moist production area and water holding and then warmer microclimate, more moisture. By summer, this will be completely dry walkway. But it's kind of neat to have these little island effects all through here. And my hope is to continue to expand these. And in fact, someday we'll see how it all evolves, but this whole area may very well be a pond or that same super complex system like these where you've got hugel mounds with little seasonal micro ponds in between them little wet trenches to wick and soak water in so these are performing nicely i'm hoping to have enough soil to cap these this season that they become full fully productive for annuals and hopefully the water will hold just upslope for a little ways so we have a source of irrigation to get those annuals established. The main thing I'm most interested or excited to share with folks, uh, those of you that watch this channel somewhat closely, are probably interested to know what came of the very large scale, at least in my mind, for human digging. I documented this a number of times during last summer and I'll link here to the first video showing the concept behind this pond. Um, and it still definitely remains to be seen how well it will hold water, how long it will hold water. I mused in that video about whether or not I would use a EPDM pond liner or would sodium bentonite or bring in clay. I haven't done any of those things, so it's completely natural at this point. And we'll just learn from it and evolve and shift as needed. But there she goes. So exciting to see this, my gosh. So beautiful. Um, there's Miscanthus Island. A lot of you voted leave the island. So the island is left. There's Stump Island over there. We'll take a look in a moment. Just floating in the water. I believe this water level could go higher. But we just kind of eyeballed the overall look and feel of this. It worked out pretty nicely. Persimmon Island. <laughs> <laughs> see how how that persimmon does there's enough soil right around their roots maybe they'll do okay um, but there it is holding lots and lots of water right now I don't know how many gallons but many many tens of thousands of gallons as of right now which is just thrilling it feels really beautiful to be out here I, I hope some wild ducks uh, find this spot and have some babies in there some little little eggs laid. Feels like a really perfect nook for that sort of activity to happen. What I think I'm understanding is that the water level currently is being determined by this part right here. So yesterday I noticed there was water here. You can still see some water here. And this was very, very wet. And that area down there was, had standing water, which tells me that the high water line, it's probably leaking through this spot. So I added some clay here. I'm fully expecting to need to modify it this way, but I've added some clay, stepped it down, and we'll see if we get some rains. What my hope is, is not to have it drain through here, but rather swell another four to six inches. You can see 
how I was hoping that that rim there would be underwater, which it's not just yet. Um, but the ideal was that it would go a couple inches taller and ultimately have its overflow at this corner. And so at this corner, I shaved out a little bit yesterday just to see where the water line is. And it's gone up, it's come this way about three or four inches. So the water has probably gone up a quarter inch or half inch in total height since I packed the corner over there. And so my hope would be to have it overflow through here, through this miscanthus, through all the debris, kind of diffuse out into the landscape a bit and then hit this next series of ponds, which will be evolving quite a bit more this season and onward. I want to say a huge thank you to my dear friend Juan, who is so involved in this project. And a number of other folks came and plugged in here or there, so thank you. Um, but boy, what an exciting thing, and really neat to see a pond at this scale that is done with human labor, with a wheelbarrow and a shovel. Uh, we did use the BCS with the rotary plow to do primary tillage and open up the soil texture before it was moved. Um, I think that helped make all the raised beds that we generated from the excavated material a lot nicer quality texture, but it wasn't necessary. But overall, this is all, all of the material left with human labor. Feels pretty darn exciting, and I'd love to see many more of these sorts of scenarios in this landscape over time. But I probably don't need to do another one this year. <laughs> If we continue on here, again, this would be where the overflow ultimately would hopefully go. These are two older ponds that I talked about in greater detail in another video. I'll link to that. Um, this was a, a start of a sketch of a pond. This is only about four inches deep where I was harvesting topsoil to get a really good rich topsoil to cap a number of hugel mounds that are nearby. And when this dries out, maybe we'll chase another layer. But I like the idea of kind of chipping away at digging ponds by harvesting the topsoil, sending it somewhere meaningful, growing crops with it, then it fills with water, it settles out, we grow wet tolerant crops again, have residue and organic matter building in that soil, harvest again, harvest again, slowly but surely get to the full depth we need. It's windy on this end of the property, but I put a sock, yes, it could be a wind sock, but I mean literally I put a sock over the end of the phone, hopefully it's not too windy. You can see these ponds are in way more shade, and so they're actually still pretty icy. It's interesting to see those microclimate games come into fruition here. And in fact, this is shadier on the south side and gets that light in the late day, and that's where it's first thawed out. Cool to see that. But these are holding nicely. It's really great to see how clear the water is in these. It's telling me that there is not a lot of moving. The water that is moving in the landscape is interacting with enough vegetation and it's slow enough and spread out enough that it's not churning up the water. I saw all sorts of little aquatic nibblers and bibblers floating around and doing their life down in there. And maybe these will start to hold water reliably enough that we can think about adding fish. But we certainly can add water loving associate perennials like our calamus and duck potato and skirt and all sorts of fun medicine and food crops but it's slowly becoming a, a lump and pond landscape. And that edge, that intersection between different contexts touching each other and communicating is just where all the life happens. So the more of this complexity, the better, as far as I'm concerned. This one tiny little pond, we're just on the edge of this whole system, makes me very happy. It is so crystal clear that you can barely tell where the water line is. In fact, I wonder if it even comes up on the camera, but that's ice right there. That's, that's the goal with all of these ponds, is to have them so still and so filtered that where the water begins and the air begins is a confusing moment. That just means it's, it's filtered, it's alive, and seeing all the vegetation under there means those are consuming any excess nutrients that are in the water and turning them into something meaningful, like photosynthetic life, rather than cloudy, silty debris. Thanks, life, for clarifying things. This whole frozen and still set of water systems do have their overflow, which you can see is just outside of this little super still pond. And you can see there is water flow happening. In fact, so it's thawed here because it's moving. 
So I'll just stir it a little and we'll see the silt move. But it's going at a pace that I like. A snail's pace is always a good one for water in a landscape. But it's allowed to mosey past this bed, bop across through here. It gets way more shallow and broad because we need access through here in the summer months. And then it starts to enter into the main drainage channel for the center of this property. Heading right through there. So lots of water holding there. Another small pond. This was just a sketch in the fall. Again, more in the spirit of like, hey, we need some decent topsoil to cap some of these hookal mounds. And so now these beds have enough contiguous soil over the logs and leaves, and they have hay on top that they should all be good production beds in exchange for having the start of a pond. And I think there's just such extreme value in thinking about water systems in a landscape not being done all in one stroke. We're used to that with the machines. But when you iterate um, and they evolve over time, there's so much more opportunity for them to have more steps and complexity and kind of see what they're doing. How well do they hold water? This one in particular does not hold water much at all, but that's fine. It'll just leak into the soil underneath all these hugel mounds. And that's kind of what we want anyway. When we come out into the sun here and the water is all completely thawed, that's only about 10 feet away to the north actually, but there's lots of pines to our south. And so this will be a dry walkway in a few weeks, I'm sure. But for now, it's gently wicking water into the logs and debris that are underneath this whole new nursery production space, which I've got no complaints that's doing that. The overflow through here is going through all these logs and charcoal so they can scrub out some nutrient, clarify and slow the water down because from here it starts to accelerate a little bit. And I can definitely see this channel looks a little bit more boggy but that's okay there's a bunch of hay that was laying in here all winter and that's certainly leaching nutrient in fact i see dead worms in there i think probably from the soil being saturated they were they came in to eat the hay and then the snow and ice melted and it became water and they must have died but because this channel is next to production beds having a little excess nutrient that can be drawn into the beds as it moves by I'm okay with that. We're not we're not trying to have drinking water here, but the more vegetative life, like we really need watercress in here now. We need to think about rice. We need to think about um, some perennial uh, water-loving elements that can occupy the space year-round and start really grabbing all that excess nutrient. And then we can throw hay and let it get wicked up into some of those crops and filtered later on. Anyway. Um, this is kind of interesting. Yesterday, I noticed where I had bermed up, this was the channel where it used to go. I had bermed this up in the fall because I wanted the water level to come up, but this area was actually flooding enough that I needed to release it. So the open valve state to release it was just two minutes with shovel work, and now it can equalize to the bottom of that. You can see that it's still running now, it's 24 hours later, and it definitely sent a lot of silt into here for a moment, but it's already clarified because of all the texture underneath. And I put in some sticks and logs to kind of catch any silt that would otherwise want to move through. But we're getting pretty close to the second big pond system, which I would call the irrigation pond. And recently, I'll link here to this, um, I was talking about how we were redirecting some of the water from our neighbor's orchard through a filtering channel and ultimately into this space, and it worked. Here we are, filled, filled right on up, murky. So that's probably because it is a raw cut, you know, it was made in the summer, and there's probably lots of clay and silt that's still in suspension. So hopefully that'll clarify and settle, and the overflow on this goes back out, and can overflow and go back into that channel, but there's definitely a lot of water in here. It's about yeah, four feet deep, maybe, uh, through most of it. So enough to fill this container like 30 times over, maybe. We're gonna wait till we get past the absolute coldest time. We get, uh, tomorrow night will be 14 degrees Fahrenheit. So there's no point in starting to charge water into these until we're past the risk of frost. And some folks mentioned, and it's very true, these need way wider and more stable earth platforms. So we'll chip away at that so that come May, we can grab this water 
and with solar panels and little pumps send it into these cisterns so we have gravity feed out to all these new production beds and the overflow state from these can come out and go around and dump into swales on contour between all these production beds so basically just the overabundance of water when that's the case the sun will dump it in the walkways where production is happening last night by headlamp i added some elders to the edge here and i think what i'll do is actually plant out wet loving nice high value perennials around the entire boundary of this because i anticipate this going down and there's a walkway in under the water so that come july when it's time to harvest elder we can walk on this side or on the walkway believe it or not and get all the fruit and if there are fish or other aquatic creatures in here any fruit that drops can just feed those creatures and a fish might like elderberry fruit i don't know this water channel on the west end of our property which uh, allows in the water from our neighbor's orchard and runs this way and ultimately gets to that last pond we were looking at but through a bunch of switchbacks it's there's definitely water in here but it is running super slow and super gentle so that's what we're looking for my hope uh, the last two batches of charcoal that i made rendered enough charcoal that i think once i scrape the bottom of this out to clean out leaves from over winter and get that up onto the beds i'll put about an inch of charcoal through the entire bottom of this so that any water that comes in from their orchard passes over through hundreds of feet of textured charcoal on its way towards the beginning of the filtering process to ultimately get into that irrigation pond but right now their their watershed is not contributing anything on the surface that's the overflow diverter that sends to that pond you can see the pond is just right over there um, but right now it's not contributing anything which is good because the pond is full and we don't need any excess nutrient from their orchard or excess questionable bits lots more cleanup work to do lots more planting and seed starting a million things to do as far as getting the growing season going but it feels just so rewarding to see these water holding elements in the landscape after such good hard physical honest work last summer and during a drought to boot so here we are six months later and it feels like the very opposite end of the world with that and hopefully physically the structures should last many many lifetimes and whether they hold water reliably remains to be seen but by avoiding the commitment to plastic and clay and sealants now uh, we can always ease into that later or just learn to work with the pulsing of the water and so more of these containers lined up near these water bodies i think is going to be the move in the future it's probably a good long video long enough if you're still with me on this video thanks <laughs> um but yeah i the part of what i really love about this is i've had a vision of working with a landscape with this amount of complexity since i was a younger person and it's just just beginning to show what it is that in my dreams i would imagine it to look like i'd actually used to have visions of having these canals in between garden beds that you could use a a very shallow canoe and pull yourself between the beds to harvest into the canoe i don't know if that's necessarily in the cards for this landscape but um we're at least chipping away towards that but yeah we'll end with this first pond the big one with duck island thank you all for your suggestions and ideas and words of encouragement while this whole process was happening last summer and hopefully to some of you it feels as rewarding as it does to me to see the reflection of the trees in tens of thousands of gallons of water at the highest point in our landscape. Thanks for sticking with me on this long video. Hope you are all doing well and have saturated and hopeful landscapes for this upcoming growing season. Take care.